Yeah, yeah, I do. There you go. I'm just gonna start recording. So yeah, no worries. I was working away there. Um, all good, good. So how how's your day been? Uh, not bad. We've got school holidays over here, so it's a bit of a a bit of a chore getting the um getting the lad to sleep at night because he's uh just thinks that it's um party time. So hence why we're a little bit late. <laughs> yeah, full of beans, I guess. That's up. Yeah, cool. So, um, yeah, I guess like I don't know. I'm I'm pretty open to like what you wanted to speak about and stuff, but um, like yeah, we can go go whichever way you want. I know you're kind of mentioning <laughs> the, the technical stuff. I've never. You probably learn, but I've never like <clears throat> through this. But I've never like hosted a podcast or anything. So I I literally was oh, actually on my, I was on I was on my first one yesterday. Um, so. I mean, I don't even know if this is a podcast or whatever you want to call it, but uh, yeah, it's cool. Just, chat, it's a chat chat. It's a um, chat. Yeah, but yeah. Anyway, what you've been so what you've been uh, filling your day? I suppose it's been a while since you you retired and stuff. But what you've been filling your days with? Uh, too much, to be honest. Um, yeah, I I work business development over here for a company, but we supply all the concept two gear. Um, and then we run the indoor association as well here in New Zealand. Uh, and then I'm working with the team at Asense, so the, uh, the okay. Indoor Rowing um, Connected Coaching. Um, and then I'm patron of Autism New Zealand because my boy's autistic. Um, and then public speaking, trying to renovate, trying to play golf, trying to hold down a relationship. Um, yeah, trying to be a good dad. <laughs> it's, uh, there's, there's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot going on for sure. Nice one, nice one, yeah. Yeah, I suppose I'm, I'm very much, I guess, would be like in the opposite camp i've just recently relatively recently retired from like rowing and training full-time and uh yeah i've got a lot of time on my hand to basically just do one thing so uh, i mean i'm getting i'm getting married i'm getting married in the summer in july but apart from that um basically just doing just doing lots of the coaching stuff just spamming social media as much as possible um yeah it's a it's a real interesting space because i i never really thought i'd get into like specific coaching yeah. Um, and I don't have a, I don't have a lot of time, but I've I've helped a few people out here and there, and and um, I do have to say the stuff that I've helped people with on the row machine's been pretty incredible. Um, you know, we've had people absolutely smash it, um, like two K stuff, and and I feel like I feel like there's some good stuff there that people aren't doing very well. Um, it may sound really stupid, but it's just not doing the right type of workouts building into like 2k type of thing um you know needing to to really push the boundaries go past the limit that type of thing um and so i'm quite enjoying doing that side of things but i just like on water stuff i'm like oh my god i got no time to do it hmm. but at the same time i i always see little bits you know hence why this conversation come up and i'm like oh, i don't know like you know i think yeah and, and i think that's the great thing about coaching is as Never really, you know, because when you're doing it as an athlete, you're just sitting there and you're absorbed in it and you're just like, fuck, my world, mm -hmm. you know, everything's revolving around this and, and you're talking about it with your mates and, and you know, your, your, your crew mates and, and whatever else. And you see the coaches sitting at their tables and they're, they're chattering, chattering, this, this, this and this. And I didn't probably quite realize it until now when you start actually having conversations and open conversations about like what, you know, what do you think makes a boat go fast and, and, and the likes. And then all of a sudden you're just throwing out ideas and, and chatting about it. And it's like, Oh, okay. And yeah. So basically I do feel like there's a lot that I could give back and, and I try and do as much as I can. Um, but at the same time, yeah. Coaching, coaching to me, no time, no time yeah. for that. I suppose like, that's what's cool, I guess, with the world. Obviously, I sound pretty outdated saying this, but like with how connected you can be, it's it can be such a good thing to to spread knowledge and so effective, such an efficient way of spreading knowledge. If you look back like 10, 20 years ago, you can just go down to your club and that's your your only point of information. So now it's just getting more and more connected. And I, I would agree with you. I would say that um, like for me, there's a bit of a disconnect between um, some of the world's best um coaches and the 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 content that gets consumed in terms of like volume and stuff and a good example is 
um robin williams who again maybe this is more the technical side who you may or may not agree with um one thing i should maybe say is that i think there's plenty of ways to skin a cat and good coaching is about adapting to the coach finding their own style and something they're confident about and something that works and then having like an open mind for it as well so that's kind of like my style but anyways what i was trying to say is like robin williams who i would view as probably one of the best technical coaches in the world if you go into his youtube channel he's got like 30 subscribers uh and then there's other youtube channels giving advice out that well it's good advice it's good it's it can be good advice um but Mm -hmm. the the proportion of like the the level of advice versus the amount of attention it gets it's for me it's like trying to package it and get it out there and thinking about things of like algorithm and trying to share information in a way that's also combined with like reaching people and playing you know the social media game so um yeah I'm, i'm sure you maybe you feel the same way but Oh, yeah, and it, and it is, because you see, oh, you know, like, <laughs> the indoor rowing side's fascinating for me because, like, I, I went pretty well on the rowing machine, you know, and, and I've coached people to do it really well, and, and you see some things, and you're like, oh, you know, and uh, same thing, you know, like, there's, there's ways to skin a cat, you know, and, and you'll hear people, and, and you know, with we do a live stream every week, and there's where our library is massive with with the amount of workouts and stuff we've got in there you know people are like oh but my coach told me to keep my feet flat on the thing and i'm like mm, uh, yeah that's one i'm sure we're going to yeah, disagree like, about some things but that's oh, what i definitely well, do agree on with you oh yeah and i'm and i'm just like no 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 like you've got to have some flexibility pal like okay if you're if you're doing a one minute sprint 100 percent, you're not getting anywhere near um vertical you want to be rowing three quarter slide at 45 rating and there's no way that you're going to be able to get your feet off the foot plate absolutely i I agree with that but if you're just rowing along you've got to have this this momentum and this symmetry Mm. and and you know be like an accordion type of thing you know so you you use the body's compression and then you let it extend and all this sort of stuff and you gotta you gotta try and be as biomechanic as you can with our body and the physiology um you know and, and i never studied that sort of stuff but i learned it very well from the people that coached me with it and talked to me about it and then now i'm just like hey i can show you in a specific way how to do this and it's a lot easier um but yeah sometimes you just see these comments and you're just like yeah you know it it is it is understanding that you've got so many different facets right you can have you know it's no different with with runners you can you know it's it's always easy to explain it with a runner you know you're never gonna you're never gonna train a one or 200 meter runner like you're going to train a marathon runner, but they're all running. They're all doing exactly the fucking same thing. But how do you mix them and, and mingle them together in whatever shape and form? And some of their forms probably similar, probably, <laughs> but it's just the way that you're trying to do it. One of them is trying to smash it out in 20 mm-hmm. seconds. The other one is trying to do two hours. You know, that's and that's what happens with rowing at the same time as well, because there's just so many uh so much in terms of like the people and the personnel and the size your height your weight everything about it which just always comes um into the conversation when you're talking about it Mm -hmm. yeah kind of interested just to kind of get specific with what you're saying there about the foot play i think it kind of like people kind of try and use the logic of maybe weightlifting or kind of use their background and where it's come from and i think that can step like that's where a lot of problems stem from is people just using their experience only and transferring that into rowing and you think maybe if you're trying to do a one rep max on a squat you wouldn't want if you've got 150 kilos on your back you wouldn't want your weight to go into the toes but on the rowing stroke if you look at the highest peak force that you would do at the catch it's probably not much more than 30 to 40 kilos and i guess the benefit of having that extended length and extended time where you can apply power on your your toes um with 30 to 40 kilos it's not going to cause you any issues um so yeah that's one if you can have great ankle flexibility that's fantastic good for you but yeah certainly with that that's that's a common one that i've, I've seen for sure um so i don't know what the, like i thought we were going to be getting on here and disagreeing about some technical things i thought i was expecting i was expecting well, mate, well, when we, yeah, when we, we get, get into the when we get onto the on water stuff oh god yeah <laughs> like um this is the thing is like the the i'm i've been lucky enough to be uh I, i'm on the world rowing indoor commission so we've tried. We've, we've been talking about indoor rowing, and because it's such a massive sport, um, yeah, I think it's the future uh, for globally. Sure. Um, it is, and yet we we always I and and only because of my background in, in rowing, we we keep having to find ourselves like pulling the strings back and going, hang on, hang on, hang on. 
we, we're trying to sell this to the rowers. We were not trying to sell yeah. this to the rowers. We're trying to sell this to everyone in the world. Hence why we came up with the, the Versa challenge and trying to find something different, you know, so that people would want to be involved. Because otherwise it very much is a sport where you arrive and you look at the biggest guy in the corner and you're like, what am I doing here? Like, I'm not going to beat him. You know, and that, and that becomes the issue. Whereas if you're trying to uh, find different ways for people to be able to enjoy it as mm -hmm. much as possible, uh, but then at the same time participate, want to participate, um, want to carry on doing it right through the age groups. Um, you know, that's the key because, like, unfortunately and sadly, like, Flatwater Rhine is on a massive decline yeah. in terms of participation. And it's just down to the fact that it is just too much time, you know, and yeah. we all value our time so much more. You know, like, if I was, if we had, and, you know, I've got mates that rode, you know, we rode with here, club level and, and elite, that sort of thing. I have no intention of going down to Ryan Club, go for a road. Like, I can't. You know, health and safety, you've got to have chase boats, you've got to have a crew, you've got to have this, you've got to have that, blah, blah, blah. But if I was to make this my, like, fun and enjoyment, if you gave me a 250-meter race, if there was a series of races at 250 meters, I'd be back. I'd be training three or four days a week. That would become my sport. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact is that they're like, nah, it's 2K. It's always going to be 2K. It's, it's like we're going to, like, adapt or die um, in a way. And and it's like, you know, you see it everywhere around the world, the decline. Like, rowing's a fantastic sport. Don't get me wrong. I love it. Um, I love what it does in terms of life skills and everything else going forward and, and seeing people do it and it's fun, it's enjoyable. Um, you know, re, um, work in equals results out. You know, you, you put all of those that information into it and try and do it very well and you can get some really good results out of it. But when it's finished, there's not a massive side of it that makes you want to go and do it all the time. Uh, and I think that that's probably the thing is that it's just time, the time mm -hmm. commitment is just horrific in terms yeah. of rowing. Um, and and unless that changes, it's you're just going to see more and more people be like, like I can't, you know, I'm just sick of fucking putting in so many hours yeah. and going and racing and, oh, you know. Whereas, yeah, it's not whereas, just that, is it? It's the, you know, oh, go show up to boat loading, derig, uh, get there early. For me, and like I'm in Scotland in the UK, most of the races are down seven seven hours away in London. So that was very much like you'd <laughs> derig, load, drive, get there the day before, race for six minutes, maybe if you're lucky twice in a day, and then head back up the road. So it's very different in that way. And I suppose that's kind of the, the other cool thing as well about coaster rowing. Well, for me, I've, I've not seen the appeal of it, but I appreciate that the effort that's going into changing it. But I, I agree that we definitely really do have to get so much more creative and with the olympics and how it's going it's one of the highest cost sports and one of the least watched and yeah um one idea i always thought would be cool is kind of, I'm, I'm sure people have suggested this before is but having a race where every 250 meters kind of like the cycling kieran i think where it's every 250 somebody gets dropped out so it's basically just go it's a bit of poker oh, go as hard as you can go uh, that would be yeah, hard yeah. i don't know if i would want to do that but i would definitely want to watch it <laughs> Wouldn't well, we either, probably would, sprinter. We would have been out in the first two fifty most mm. of the time. Um, yeah, yeah, true. you know, like that, this is the thing with Ryan is is fantastic. Like love, like you know, if you when you get stuck into it, it's quite addictive and everything else. And I just wanted to, I want it to see it. I want to see it continue in a different light because I like I'm not dissing it or in any. Yeah, you know, it sounds really fucking bad. But I just, you know, you, you look at the people that are doing it and, and you just, you start seeing the kids that are there and then you talk to their parents and they're just like, oh, it's just so much time and they'll mm -hmm. definitely won't do it after school. And so you're always going to have that feeder that goes into the top, the people that are like, fuck this, I'm going to go hard and I'm going to try and win the Olympic gold medal. It's great. But that massive um, void that's in the middle from 18-year-old onwards is just mm -hmm. horrific. And you know what is it what is it what's causing it you know like why why are we why why are we seeing such a decline and it's just because it's the time commitment right whereas if it was 250 races or 350 meter races i don't care um i guarantee you you would see a huge number of people wanting to do it because you still got to have some technical ability but your training becomes three or four days a week if you're lucky and you can do a lot of that on thing because you're just in such a different um um different different physiological zone right is you'd like you'd have a little bit of aerobic but it's basically anaerobic for the whole time and it's just like get the technique right punch it out 
the race is done in less than a minute. Like you get most people on to have a whirl at something for less than a minute and it's great job done. You know, I, I just, yeah. I, I don't know. I just see like ways that it should. Yeah. But yeah, it's let's get on to the technique. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I know one thing I would say is like it can be such a time effect of like training method where it's obviously like full body, so many great benefits of it compared to like running. Yeah. If you wanted to work, you know, your core, your back, whatever, your arms, your legs, like I'm sure that's the appeal to people when they first see a rowing machine in the gym and they want to be really time effective. But then as you go maybe down the funnel and you get right, okay, I really like indoor rowing, get into the racing, you get your own erg at home, super time effective. And then it's like when it comes to racing, it's like starts going in the other way. So I guess. You know, I always think with my athletes as well, I'm trying to push some of them into into like the actual rowing. I'm like, if you can love indoor rowing, you can certainly enjoy like boat rowing even more. Yeah. Like, it's just such a high, yeah. as you said, there's such a high friction point between um, time and commitment and access to equipment. So who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, hopefully. I mean, yeah. I'd like to be a part of the change, but I'm quite big on not just sitting here and like trying to criticize it. So it's cool to see you trying to make a change. And, you know, it's something, it's something I'm always thinking about is how can you, how can you decrease these friction points within the sport? But yeah, so I guess what Not you sure. kind of in, what have initi initiated <laughs> the the call was um, me talking about the finish. <laughs> and um, for me, this is such a I I want to caveat by saying like I think that's the generally the best way to do it, the most effective way. So to be clear, getting your hands way faster off the finish and getting rocked over. But at the same time, I think it's important to say that one. Other crews can do it very well, and you can get it's so interesting and rowing. You can see the A final one, oh, it's got yeah. a massive pause, and then one crew that's completely different. Um, and there's some oh. rowers that I'll coach, and I'll say, like, look, you need to slow down at the finish, especially with people when people are starting. But for me, generally, what I find the best approach is, is to get away, get prepared early, and then give yourself time at the more important part mm. of the stroke, which would be the catch. But yeah, yeah. why don't you, you take it away and um uh yeah well i'm the first of first and foremost yeah like not not no not just in any way because i i'm 100 percent. i know there's so many different ways to skin a cat and i normally keep my mouth shut on social media i don't really get into too much like I stuff because i'm just like <laughs> oh yeah and and i but then occasionally i was just you know like it's just like maybe it's not the best way you know maybe you know whatever but all i'm going to say is like over you know we 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 became very good at the craft, but it wasn't until probably a couple of years into like when we were in the pier that we finally started really getting a good verbalization and, and a good, a really good understanding of like what does make the boat go faster. And, you know, Drew Jin was right around the time when we were experimenting with some stuff. And, you know, when he came out with his, his audio clip about the coaches, I'm sure you must have heard that, the Drew Jin yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so it's a famous you know, like, one, isn't it? Yeah, uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. And we were sitting there going, ah, "This is exactly what we're trying to do," you know. And and it was just all around, you know, boat feel and movement and 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 everything. And so we actually, you know, be, and and this is the thing: is it was it's only come about in the last decade or so. For, in fact, it's probably a bit longer than that now. Um, where we've had enough technology to get an understanding of it. So prior to that, apart from a coach sitting there and watching it or you've seen video, you didn't have, um, you know, like we use the peach, the, the force gates, and it has the accelerometer and telemetry, all that sort of stuff in it. So you could see what effect you're having on the boat. Um, and so once we started really trying to verbalize it and try a few exercises, we actually were like, fuck, actually almost racing into the catch does give you more speed which is counterintuitive from what you normally hear from like coaching and that sort of stuff, right? Big, big disclaimer at the end of that. If you're not good enough to pick up the catch, you're fucked anyway. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> so <laughs> there's so many different things like that that you can do, but there's a, you've got to be doing, you know, like it's the equal and opposite reaction. And if you don't get the equal and the opposite balanced, you, you're screwed. So it doesn't really matter. Right. And, and historically, there's been so many great crews, um, you know, probably definitely a lot of the famous ones um, from from my time watching early 2000s, watching the Romanian woman. Holy shit, they got off the back fast. Man, mm. they got off the back and broke their legs and they could holy. race 16. Oh, and you watch them like glide into the front and you were like far out, you know, and it was just like so slow. But they were letting the boat run and it was just like, wow, okay, that's crazy. And so, of course, a lot of our early stuff 
just like anything and and as a trend so everybody's watching them and going get off the back fast and then slow down into the front and it seemed to work okay but then the problem is that like you can't be doing that all the time and, and hence why the conversation with you is like yeah okay well if, if, and, and i'm a big fan of and i'm not going to say pausing at the finish i think the better terminology for it is patience so there's a lot of times when we use different terminology and i think patience is probably the key so you're not stopping things are still moving but you're actually just flowing with the boat you're, you're using the inertia of the body mm to get you back forward, right? Whereas anything mechanical, like, you know, I've finished, I've got to make myself get back forward. It's a mechanical movement that's not really doing anything to the boat. Hence why, if you've got patience and you and you finish the stroke off, the hulls of the boat are designed to run through the water. It doesn't matter, like, if you're sort of sitting back in it, you know, or if you've come forward, they're dorsaling in the water, you know, 20, 30, 40 mil either way. And it's just how they're built. That's how they work. So it's more about how you're getting to the front than I would say about like what you're doing around the finish. Because the moment you've popped your knees forward and your weight distribution starting to move forward, you're going to be slowing the boat down. So this is the whole thing. Yes, you can have you can be quick off the back and slow down into the front, but if you're not good enough to pick up the catch, it doesn't matter. If you're really quick off the back, uh, sorry, if you're really slow off the back and then quick into the front, but you can't pick up the catch, you're in the same fucking position. So either way, either way, both of them have a very good pros, but they also have the big con that if you're not good enough to pick up the catch, it doesn't fucking matter which way you do it. You can do it both and you'll probably be going the same speed. You Would know, you and so say it's the, easier if you've given yourself more time going into the catch to pick up the catch. Uh, I, I definitely think that the more time is, because one of, one of our biggest learning like things and philosophies we did over our time was having the patience around the back, soft knee break, you know, and then just let that boat run underneath you and, and almost just, and we used to call it dropping into the front. So, you know, it, it's, it's like you're on the, you know, if you're on the row machine and you sit there with your feet out and then all of a sudden you just hold on to the chain against your chest, you just get pulled back to the catch, right? Just happens. The boat does exactly the same thing. So what we're both talking about here is you still got to be allowing the boat to flow underneath you, no matter whether you're coming into the front to try and put the brakes on, uh, or if you're coming into the front with a little bit of pace to be able to pick up the catch. Either way, you've got to let that boat run underneath you. Mm -hmm. And what we started to realize, and this was talking with biomechanics, um, our physiologists, like everything else, the biggest thing that you have in, in your thing of coming in and having that weight transfer down onto the feet is that you're trying to slow yourself down into the catch to then be able to take the catch, right? Because you got to, you, you get off the back and then you're I trying wouldn't to... Say it, so, I wouldn't say it's so much of like a slowing down as it is finding where yeah. the foot plate is and lowering the center of gravity rather than like yeah. actual trying to decelerate. Yeah. Um, yeah, but if you look at it in a sense of your body can only like and this is why i use it on like on the row machine your body can only get to a certain position right you can't if you try and stretch for more or you fucking you can't compress any more so the whole thing is biomechanically just letting your body get to a point where you're like i'm sitting here the knees are nearly at my chest my seat's up to my ankles or not quite you know i've got a good parallel you know and i'm sitting here and i've just got there by using my by body's natural compression to get to that point. Um, and when we started doing that, we weren't actually thinking about just like, uh, uh, like you know, it, it's like trying to find the catch point, like you've got to find where it is rather than just being like, I'm gonna roll till I can't fucking mm -hmm. get any more compression. I'm just gonna pull the blade in, you know? And so we started doing a lot of things like that because it was like, why are we always trying to, we're trying to stretch right off the back. We're getting our hands way over our knees. We're in this really uncomfortable fucking position. Whereas you can be set up 95%, right? You can have your hands over your knees. You've got a little bit of suppleness in your arms. You've got a little bit of suppleness in your legs. And then you can roll forward. And by the time you reach the catch, then you're ready for the catch. And that's what started to make a dramatic change in our pace, like both training and in racing. 
was, was because that, beforehand... uh, just to be clear because like what i would say in 2012 you guys had very good length up at race pace would you say that was was that right before then that you guys started to find find your length because you're re really long at the high rates and stuff like really good job of yeah like, but what we were doing is yeah but what was happening right is that you're trying to stretch you're trying to get set off the bat you're trying to be set before you roll off the bat right but like we were always coached hands across the knees halfway down the shin set up and then roll into the catch and hold your body position right mm -hmm. fucking uncomfortable it's terrible right whereas you can be you can get your hands out you can get them out over you can get everything started but you can be 95 percent. you're not like really stretched you've got a little mm -hmm. bit of suppleness so like if something goes wrong on the way forward you know like how many times you see it with athletes and they're all set they're all stiff they're rolling into the catch and then the boat goes off level and it's fucked. The whole stroke's ruined. But if you've got an element of suppleness because you're, you're waiting for the body to get into that compressive state, you've still got the body over. It's still yeah. stretched. You know, it's not like you're sitting forward and then doing that into the catch. You're coming forward, okay? And then just before the catch is when the body's naturally compressing. And so all of a sudden, you've just got this natural length with yeah. the body at the front. And that was just such a dramatic change to us because we were like, fuck, we've been spending all these years getting set up, trying to be stiff. Try, well, I shouldn't say stiff. Trying to be like, I have a really good posture, you know, controlled, um, composed com posture as we come into the catch. So we're all ready. You know, it, it was just years and years of just honing it into you. Be ready before the catch. Be ready before the catch and all this sort of stuff. So... That was just the way that we were taught. And, and right, we can, we can have this a massive open-ended conversation because at the end of the day, you've got to start like that with a crew that, are, that aren't experienced because if you try and get them to all move slightly different, you're just going to watch the crew go and blah, 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 like they're all going to be doing this as they come forward, yeah. you know, and, you, and you'll see all of this. So you, you do have to create an element of symmetry rather than like shit happening like that because it'll look fucking terrible yeah but once you get a little bit once you get a little bit more mature and just understand the body and the way that it's just going to get into a compressive state you start to use that to your to your advantage you're not having to get yourself to the front you're just going to roll forward and you're just there and it just happens and i think that's one of the things is there's a lot of things especially on the row machine as well um that we just don't use the machinery or the boat or the setup of the boat to our advantage. We try too hard to get ourselves into positions, which I know we need to be in those positions at, you know, by the time we take the catch, but we try too hard to get into those positions rather than it just naturally happening, mm -hmm. rather than just letting it happen into the catch. And like, Oh, I'm going to pick on them because it's, it, it is the <laughs> British program is not British program is an absolute classic for that. All the guys, very stiff, you know, really like um, blocky is probably the term, you know, very straight backs, you know, get across, you know, really, you know, upright, really, you know, up here. And you the see sweet it. squad and okay, certainly is, yeah, the sweet uh, squad. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and okay, but and then we go right back to the thing. It works. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's like you can sit there going, oh, okay, shit, well, yeah, but it does work. So this is the thing. It's like, which way do you want to be? Which way do you want to be going with this? Yeah, um, and I guess I, for me, it's we, like the most. What's what's the most um, simple approach that you can explain that's doable? That is, um, you know, a combination of just like checkpoints, maybe, but also the 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 room to kind of add some flair and flexibility and like fluidity is what you're kind of talking about, which obviously takes a lot of skill and just strokes and strokes repetition. One thing I wanted to say was um, with getting into that position early, uh, I would never coach somebody to, to be forced into that position too early. Like I would find where is the comfortable position that you can sit. And I guess that's maybe one of your points about how the British can be quite rigid and upright. I would get, get the athlete to get into that position as early as possible and accept that's where they are. But one thing I do is like with weights training and mobility work is make that number one priority, the mobility and the technical side of the boat. And often my weights plans are built around changing the position of an athlete and structurally and giving them the support so that they can hold that position kind of in a way that yeah. where you're talking yeah. about being relaxed and being loose. Cause I, I totally agree that if there's one technical thing that you can give somebody to improve, it's going to be relaxed more. That's probably the most like, you can do anything you want. Well, that's obviously an exaggeration, but being relaxed and fluid is really important. 
other thing I would say is that you're talking about, and I, 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 I kind of, I see what you mean, like where you wouldn't be super, you in particular, I would say like you would do this differently to Hamish um, in, in the pair where he almost looked like he would get really good hip mobility and then hold it. Whereas you were more um, fluid. I'd say that could also be a problem area for beginner athletes, because if you're not set going in, not even beginner, but at all levels, um, elite beginner, I think, which is kind of the cool part about it is if you're not set going in, if you have rigidity or if you, you're not perfectly loose, then you give yourself that you, you kind of rate, like create that platform where you can disrupt the, the run of the boat at the point where mm. I think you're going to damage it the most. So, um, yeah, I would say and that, that's maybe, again, I don't we can go off on tangents, but maybe that's with you. Um, you guys didn't do weights and maybe um, your technique was more tailored to the kind of holistic side of rowing rather than like checkpoints. And maybe what you're saying around the, the British mm. style where it's more like, this is how you do things. And I, don't get me wrong, I have my criticisms for that and that rigidity and um yeah, uh, I'd be, I I mean, yeah, I want to ask you. I want to ask you maybe about weights training as well, but I suppose that's yeah, there. that's a whole other discussion. Oh, no, nah, we'll <laughs> get into that. The um, the thing is, we used to be like a lot of, uh, yeah, I, I, what you're saying about the holistic side of it. A lot of it was um, we used to like the, our terminologies were things like being supple, you know, to a point where you know, and and I know it's it, it's it, it's a classical coaching style where it's like. You know, you've got to be able to like feel it in your in your knees as you're coming forward. You know, if, if the boat starts rocking around, not make, you know, changes and, and try and get it back to level, you know, just let it flow and fold underneath you. So a lot of things that we were doing were about that because at the end of the day, what we started to understand is that the fastest rowers in the world are the most efficient, okay? Because you take every row in the world and they – they generally row very fast on the rowing machine. Okay. It's, you know, standard deviation is pretty tight. Um, you know, they're pretty, they're very fucking fit. <laughs> they're pretty tall, um, you know, lean, everything about them. So how do you, how do you separate them rather than being like, actually, you've got to find the recipe that's working. Okay. You know, and you've got, you've got strength, fitness and technique. And if you want to be real strong, then obviously your fitness is potentially going to be a little bit less. And where's your technique going to end up, right? And then you could be like what we were doing. Strength training was pretty low. Fitness was fucking way up here. And then we just shuffled this up as high as we could. So then our technique plus our fitness just meant game over, mm. you know. But in, in all those ways, it's very hard to try and get all – you can't get all of those three up here. It's impossible. You don't have time. Um, and so you just got to figure out how, how do you want to do this? Do you want to have good fit? Like we've got reasonably good fitness and technique and uh, sorry, fitness and, and strength, but we're just really going to work hard on our technique. And I feel like that's like the Dutch, I, you know, I could, could be wrong, but I always used to see the Dutch and they, fuck, they rode beautifully, you know, it just really smooth with the boat and, you know, big, tall, lanky guys. And you're like, well, you seem to not, they, they always talk about how they don't row for like three or four months and they're just on the, you know, rowing machines because they're frozen. They do I thought shit. they did weights. Do they not? They oh no, but they ripped. no, but no, oh, right, no, but okay. they, they do. No, no, okay. but they do. But what I'm cool, saying cool. is, we 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 come we came from a program where we were rowing 365 days a year, and then when yeah. people are telling you like, oh no, we're on, not on the water for a couple of months, like six weeks or fucking whatever. One, we're one thing to interrupt. Just, like, um, is it? I read your guys' book, and was it true? Three, uh, two months of 300k a week. Yeah, 300k a week for uh, two months consecutively. Is that right? Uh, yeah, one of the years. Yeah, oh, <laughs> that's bad. It was, to me. it was horrific. Nah, and yeah, it was, it wasn't pretty. I gotta say, it wasn't pretty. Uh, fucking yeah, yeah some of that stuff was horrendous. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, yeah, I just wanted to ask that question because I did want, like, you know, I, I feel like some rowers will be like, oh, oh, yeah, we train seven hours a day, seven days a week, and like describe the, one, the higher end, not saying yeah. that you, were, you were saying that, but I was just the thing curious, is, if we. Though, if we could have gone, if if I could have gone back and done it again, which obviously um, you you learn, like people say, oh, you know, what 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 would you what would you do? What would you do again? You know, what would you change? What you know, what decisions would you make slightly different? Uh, decision we probably would have gotten the pair earlier. Um, that's one. But the other part is I wouldn't have done a lot because like what we learned from it 
made us better athletes. You know, yeah. when we were doing these horrific training, if when we we're doing these horrific training sessions with Dick, it was just like survive or die, right? And you just fucking survive. And we became so fit, it was just ridiculous how fit we were. You know, like training sessions were a piece of cake. You know, the pieces we were doing were a piece of cake. And then of course, racing just became so easy because we were we were literally fitter than everybody else. Um, I don't think we rode as well. We started getting better as we went along, but our first couple of years, we were just rowing on pure adrenaline and fitness, you know, and that's why um, Andy and Pete couldn't beat us because we were just too fit. You know, there's a couple of, couple of ones where we, like Hamish had been injured and we they were pretty close, um, you know, but at the end of the day, we were just fitter, you know, and, and that was it, it was always going to be good enough to get through. But when we started in our second cycle, when we had Noel Donaldson as our coach, um, we sat down with him and like I jokingly threw it out there, but at the same time I was serious. I was like, "Can we do less? Can we do less rowing?" And he goes, "Yeah." And I was like, "What?" I was like, "What?" And he goes, "Yeah, but we're going to end up doing more training." And I was like, <laughs> "Ah, ah, okay." But what we did, and and so we we basically, and and it was for the first year or so, it was we we didn't probably get very good. Um, rapport from our teammates because Hamish and I were only rowing once a day. We were on the water once mm. a day. We did six rowing sessions a week. Catch you later. We're fucking going home. We're going to be on the bikes and the rowing machines for the rest of it. Is that but when we you guys fit. were doing different, like you would go and do something different and Hamish would go on the bike or something? Yeah, I thought yeah. that was cool. Like, yeah. That's, well, that's one so of the we benefits much... of the online stuff as well is that you can yeah. customize. That's what I love is customize it to the individual. But yeah, yeah it's and cool that's to see what, a national that's... team doing yeah. that, I think. That's what we took out of it, and, and it worked very, very well. In our later couple of years, we started doing one more rowing session in the afternoon a week, which was just mainly like either te technically technical specific um, or else we'd go out and do some starts or something like that because we weren't practicing starts. We're like, fuck, who cares? Like, at, at the end of our thing, we were like, we just don't really care. We stopped. We, 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 we pretty much did just stop practicing starts because we're like, we don't really give a fuck about first 10 strokes. We'll, did you do them before the Olympics? How, how few starts did you do before the Olympics then? I'm curious. That'd be, I don't know, there's maybe a funny uh, start No, there. but they'd be, they'd be as part of like pieces and, and okay. whatever. Right. But that wasn't where we were trying to find, like, you know, we were like, cares like fuck it we, we, we yeah. know we're going to do like a we know we're going to be a second or two behind after the 500 but we know that nobody's going to match our pace through the middle case so it's just like well and and it was a mental thing for us because we're just like oh well, whatever um not like we were not trying to get out of the block so we're still trying pretty hard but we were just like oh well we're fourth or fifth or wherever we are after 250 and then we were just like hold pace and then when everybody started slowing down we just didn't slow down you know, and yeah. that was the key. That's that's a crucial key, right? You go back to, you know, part of this conversation we were having before about, you know, the most efficient. It was us. Yeah, you just know, don't waste energy on this part, right? Well, well the, the fact that we could even split races, all our big races were even split, um, like two to the number, absolute to the number, you know, like same split, first K, second K, same split, second 500, third 500 by point zero one. You know, like, how do you do that? And that was, and but that was our goal. Whereas we're looking, you look at the data, you know, you get the statistics and you go, well, on average, what do people slow down in the third 500? One to two seconds. Imagine if we didn't slow that down. Where are <laughs> we now? You know, you know what I mean? You, you just got to yeah. start coming up with, you got to start coming up with better ways to break down the race. And, you know, you, you look back in history and you go, you know, 2003, 2004 was a classic the Canadian men's four that used to be able to do a 122, 123 first 500. Like, how do you go that fast? Do you yeah. know, but then they do a one, then they do a 130 and then they do a 133, but they're still on track to go sub six easily. And they're like three lengths in front of everybody. So they don't give a shit. You know, they're just going to roll along and win the race. Even if they win by a seat, who cares? You won, you know, like, and that's it. You know, you start, you start finding people that are trying to do different parts of a race and they're like we're going to focus on the starts we're going to do this and if that's how you want to win the races like great you know and and historically Jürgen was was a massive fan of that you know we've got to get out in front we want to push you know like their one minute push or whatever they used to do in the four that pushed them out in front and they got out in front and then you just dictate the race from there and it's like good catch you later you know and this is this is the whole thing with coaching different ways to skin a cat yeah. you know they could I think have a done big take home or... though 
a big take home from what you're saying is definitely just be super confident in what is going to be the best plan for you and just stay as internal as possible. And I guess likewise for the, the biggest thing I would say is don't base your plan off of what other people do. And, you know, whether you're a crew that starts really fast, but like you guys, it's, it's, it's in, really interesting to hear like how internally confident you can be in what, you know, you're maybe not thinking about what's going to win, but what you're thinking about, like what's going to be the fastest way for you to do it. So yeah, well, certainly you, a really big one, take one takeaway, one takeaway that I, I try and get through to people and, and kids and, and other people I'm talking about is, is we've got to go away and I know it's hard to say, it's really hard to say, <laughs> got to go away from these, like trying to make these massive moves during a race. Um, they don't work. You know, like, I, like a power people, 11 people instead are, of a power 10. Oh, everybody does a power 10. Uh, just do one nah, stroke like, harder and just, you'll go faster. T- no, but take, take them right out of the equation. Like, you know, because what happens is you can, you fucking look at the speed data again. This is a great thing with technology. You can put it on your crew, right? And you'll be like, oh, and, and we'll use round numbers here because it's easy. They're doing a one minute 30 split. Great. You know, and we do a power 10, they go down to 128. Beautiful. And then 10 strokes later, they're on 133. Why didn't you just stay on 130? Why didn't you just keep it efficient? Why didn't you call like a sharper catches work? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Feel it. Feel, you know, like, why don't you then go, yeah, now combine it with the finish. Boom, boom, boom. Yes, we haven't dropped any pace. We've actually gained some. And what have we done? We've not added any more. You're trying to burn a candle that's already just about fucking burned out. Yeah. And that's why people get to the finish and they're off their feet because they've like tried to burn this. You know, if you've got to take a pie and cut it into four even quarters. But if you eat half of it in the, in the second 500, you've only got a quarter left for the rest of the race. And so somewhere it's got to go. Like, it's very, very simple. You've got, that's all you've got, you know. It's, or, you, you know, take yeah. a cup of water and it's like, oh, oh, shit. And yeah, yeah, then, yeah. It's like, well, now it's empty and you're rowing in wet cement for the last 200 meters and getting past or not being able to catch a crew. And you're just like, oh, well, you know. Um, and those those are the sort of the common mistakes. I, I shouldn't say mistakes because at the end of the day, you're trying to motivate, you're trying to do everything through those parts. But once we started getting rid of all of that nonsense, like power this, power that, power yeah. this, we were just trying to, all we were trying to do is not slow the boat down as much as everybody else is slowing down. That's as simple as it gets. Turn turn the mindset to be, got to be bigger, got to be stronger, be efficient, be be have have a way better way of doing it. Slow down less. Slow down less should be the key, you know, you know, one, one, 130, 131, 132, and then whatever at the finish. Great. Well done. That should be the goal, you know, not going out there and saying, oh, we're going to do these massive moves and we're going to try and pass crew in this thing. It's just like, just don't slow down, you know, and that's the thing is once you start really getting the understanding of the rowing and the, the trying to make their boat go fast and trying to hold the pace and, and the speed, um, you just look at it differently, you know, and it, and it translates into the training. It's like, how smooth can I be? How quiet can I be? Because mm. noise, noise is loss of speed. Bang, bang, around the catch. Fucking lost speed, lost energy. You're trying to add the number of, if you can do two or three watts per stroke less by not ripping it into the finish and letting it brush the body, and you multiply that by 200 strokes that you're doing down the course, what do you got there? You've got 600 watts. Okay, how much is 600 watts in terms of pace or speed? Uh, I'd say that's a second, maybe two. It could be two or three meters. You know, you start, you've got to start looking at things differently like that. And that's really what we started to do because we weren't bigger than anybody else. We weren't stronger than anybody else. Come on, Hamish is a freak. Hamish is an outlier. He's He's got to be out there. He's a physiological freak, but he's not very strong. He's not very strong. He's not very tall. He's he's on. If you put him, if you ranked him in terms of the the pairs that were racing at the time, he's in the bottom quarter of height and bottom quarter in, in strength all day of the week. But in terms of um, physiology, in terms of power to weight ratio, yeah. number one, probably probably yeah. number one in the boat park. Like there'd be very very few lightweights who would have beaten him. Um, but that's the thing, right? Is it's, that's just what you got to look at and say, well. If I can't be the biggest and strongest, can I be the most efficient? Can I be the smoothest? Um, and that's where you've just got to start to ask yourself, how am I going to be able to do this? Because you can win. Anybody can win. You know, you don't have to be, you don't have to be the physical specimens. You don't have to be this size. You don't have to be that. Any single person out there can win. You just got to do it properly in mm-hmm. the way that you need to do it. 
And that's, you just got to find out the combination, the recipe, the mixture that's going to allow you to do that in terms of training, setup, um, mental space, everything about it. And you just get that nicely together. You put it in a bowl and you go, I'm going to go do it today. And you can do it. That's yeah. as simple as that. I know it sounds, sounds real simple, but at the same time, that's I've got, difficult. Yeah. And I think like for one, a couple of things to say is like that, method you're talking about is like the process and becoming internal one i think that's much more enjoyable way to do your training i think basing what you're doing and always looking at other people and external things that you can't control i think one makes it unenjoyable and then two i also think people don't like to look at the simple stuff at the internal stuff because that then becomes about them and it's a factor that is they become the factor in the change Whereas if you can have, like, if people like like to look to external things, like all the sm- small details, if you can have more of that, then it becomes about external things. And it, it kind of, it can maybe give people the illusion that they're they're getting rid of pressure on themselves. And like, it, it becomes an external thing rather than what you're saying is like process. And I would see as an internal factor and the stuff that makes a difference. And I think if you can really shift it to that internal stuff, it makes the whole process so much more enjoyable which is kind of i guess like yeah. what you're saying at the start of the sport and i think it's why people can be really put off of, of the sport is that that enjo- unenjoyment comes from looking at things you can't mm. control um, yeah no it does yeah for sure for sure but yeah yeah so many things like i'm really really enjoying listening to all this insight and stuff like that and how um it was, it was always cool watching you guys like go off the start like that and just be super super chilled and um and just slice through everybody every time mm. um yeah um so how are you like yeah how first off we maybe should have said like how are you doing for time and everything I, uh, there's a few other things no i'm good yeah no, no 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 you you just took a long bail no yeah, yeah cool yeah. um yeah okay so the technical thing, I, I guess we kind of covered that side of it. A um, little bit. All yeah, I'll say bit. is about the tech. All I'll say about our technique, and, and I think you know, it's like I'm not going to tell people you should do this and you should do that, right? A lot of a lot of what I like to talk to people about, and when they ask me questions, is I'll give you a few ideas about what we thought about, and then you take it away, and then you try it. Um, you know, the whole, the whole, and and. Um, the whole way of of thinking about rowing is what you need to look at first in terms of what does make the boat go fast? What am I doing to affect the boat? And, you know, how does that look? And experimenting with it, getting out in a single, giving it a go, you know, trying to understand how things should be working and how can you save, how can you save energy? How can you be more efficient and patient, and smooth, you know, um, that was that was our goal as we went through, you know, like to a point, and, and if you've watched any of the races and, and there's some great ones at Lucerne, I think 2015, 2015 Lucerne, there's a really good clip of Hamish and he's about that far away from his body with the handle. And yeah. that used to be one of our, that used to be one of our biggest things that we did working in the boat was that when you look at the force data and you look at the curves and you look at everything, just before it's about to hit the body, about that far away the force curves just about hit the bottom and so everybody's like hold it through hold it through you're not doing fucking anything to the boat you're not doing anything to the boat once that once the legs and the body have been driven and you're basically holding like your arms are starting to come in the the force is plummeting like you would not believe and yet we use all this energy to try and hold it into the body and it's just like just fucking stop, you know, like just let it, let it happen, let it flow around. So you can let the blade come out of the water with the pressure that's behind it. So the little vortex that's behind it just mm. naturally lets it out, you know. And, and so all of a sudden we were just like, then you can focus more on that midsection of the stroke where, you know, one of, one of the ways, and, and I talk about it on the, on the um, when I'm on the row machine, you know, everyone's had an old spinning top, you know, and you hold it there and you get the string and you, and you pull it out of there, mm. right? If that's like a rowing stroke, you can't just rip it from the front because then the yeah. spinning top's fucking everywhere, right? But you've got to create that speed. And so you create that acceleration through. And so that's no different with the rowing stroke. Is like there's too much effort from most people put onto that front end of the stroke. Whereas once the legs are driving the body, that's where your force is coming in. You know, so yeah. yes, you want to connect. You want to have that patience off the front. 
But then once that's happening, it's like, and, and, and you relate it to every every person that's ever done a clean in their whole entire fucking life. Yeah, for sure, yeah. You know, you're not, you're, you're, you've got engagement off the front, but once that body starts coming in, boom, there's your money. Yeah. The most so powerful movement the up. human body can do, isn't it? If you put it on a force, but that, that hip snap is the most like yeah. force we can produce as a human. So oh, absolutely. And so, yeah. so we were like going, we need to focus on that part of the stroke. And to a point, sometimes it looked a little bit like body was like, especially with Hamish occasionally looked like he really like, especially at training, his body used to come back quite early and I'd be like, just hold it back just a little bit. We'll just hang a little bit sooner and whatever. Um, but that's where that's where you, the strokes made. But this is where you've got to get out there and, and experiment with it. You know, too too often we're focused on getting the catch. You know, it's like get to the front, put the blade in the water. Um, whereas we were just like, you know, and, and it's the classical exercise when you can sit there in pairs and you just let the handle go, and what happens to the blade? It goes in the water. So why aren't you trying to do that on the same time as you're coming forward? You know, it's just back. And so a lot of what we used to say is just called back to the water. So all you're trying to do is just go back to the water put it in the fucking water you know don't get there to try and and try and put it in the water just let it go and just drop in late square just go it wants it to go home it wants to go home it wants to go home. home and the, and the, the same thing around packed. the finish you have a good more yeah, fun that's it oh oh 100 yeah. percent um <laughs> but but that's but that's the same around the finish and it's the same on the rowing machine you know and, and i know I know that when we're trying to sit there at 20 rate or 18 and we're trying to get max speed, you know, we're trying to hit mid, mid 140s or low 140s as elites and fucking whatever, right? Is you've got to hold it right through and that's why everyone's fucking drawing right up to here because you, you're doing it. But is that really help? Like, yes, that's helping you if you're, if you're really, if that's what you're trying to do. If you're trying to get a better 2K and come through, you don't need to draw it up that far. You know, you need to be like, actually just brush the body with the hand right up against the nipples, boom and around. Mm. And use less energy in that last part, which can then be translated to more energy during the stroke. Same thing here, right? 10 watts every stroke that you're trying to pull it in with the handles, translate that into an extra 10 watts on your, on your, on your screen. It's point something of a second per split, okay? If it's 0.25, yeah, there's, for sure. there's yeah, a yeah. second, it, you know, there's, there's your like, times ah, yeah, yeah, and, well, and that's, and that's what you've got to start sure. to understand. Um, and so those, those were the main philosophies, and I've, I've taken it to be on the row machine as well, because, um, you've got to be driving the body. Um, you know, I think, I think yeah, from what we started, what we started doing, and I know you take it back to the simple form of, of understanding and learning a novice or an intermediate, um, like student or an athlete, whatever is you've got to get them to understand they have to engage that leg. The legs have to drive first. We, we yeah, all get yeah. that. We all understand that. But the more you start to understand it is as the legs are driving, they need to be doing that. They need to be driving that body backwards. Now, not to a point where the first movement's that off the catch, but if, if that can happen nearly all the way through, you look at the force curve on the screen and it's just this beautiful hemisphere and you're like, fuck, that's great. That's as, that's as biomechanically good as you're going to get. Perfect hemisphere on the screen. That's it. You can't do any better. Okay. The only thing you can do is put more power in. Okay. But that requires fitness and strength. But in yeah. terms of technique, especially on the row machine, you know, not people aren't using the force curve enough. Yeah. People one thing I would enough. Oh, like it just I, baffles me. Some a good example of this, I'm sure people listening have maybe seen well, some have seen it before, is like when you guys did your London race and it was you could tell you guys had like that strong opening and then there was the French that you can tell went off really hard and they had that strong opening but if you watch as you separate you guys had kept that strong snap and opening through as you moved away in the French you could tell they were just going like that as hard as they could and it was generating a lot of boat speed but where they lacked it, it was just the ability to to keep going with that and you could see as their backswing died that they started slowing down and um so that's, I think it's something that, happens, that needs to that be to really trained though. into yeah and it needs to be i think one thing to take home as well is like it needs to be done in your training like it can be easy to forget about it at the lower rates um and not have that snap that you you need to build the endurance in the head it's such a hard it's such a hard place to to sustain though because you can push with the legs and when you're like fuck i'm, I'm running out of juice the legs are a big muscle group and you can feel the push. You can feel the output that you're generating from that push. 
Whereas when that body starts to, to wane, you're like, oh, fuck, I'm, I'm losing the body speed. So that's where it starts getting tricky. Um, but a lot of it always just comes back to your ability to hold on to the ore, you know, and like sculling is your classical where you get people go, I tied up my hands, my arms, my forearms were fucked, you know, and I just couldn't hold on to that, the ore anymore, right? And, and that's yeah. no different is that you've got to use these levers, you know, and, and, and this is why weight training versus rowing, you, you've got to have the two hand in hand. I'm not going to lie, you've got to have two hand in hand. The only reason we didn't do it was because we're not, we weren't going to get any stronger. We were doing weights every year to get back to the same fucking point every year. And we're only about 30 kilograms lighter in terms of, of strength anyway. So is that a lot? Could we, you know, well, that, you know, whatever. But being able to use those levers and get strong in your hanging muscles is really critical. So, you know, like your hands are, are, are an absolute beast, right? And it's come from evolution. You know, you, I can, anyone can hold on to a chin up bar and you could probably put a weight around your waist as well. And you could, you can hang there for a while. You know, you could hang there for 10, 20 seconds. I don't know. The moment you put a little bit of arm bend in there, you will be there, lucky to be there for three or four yeah, seconds. Yeah, that's the analogy I always use. I'm like, how would you want yep. to hang if I told you to hang from a chin up bar for as long as possible? Yep. Try and do the and, same And you just translate, you translate that down into your lats and of course the lats and under the armpits. And you've just got to keep everything low. And, you know, mm. I agree with your sentiment on, on what you're saying online is that everything's got to be low. And too often as well, and this is this will get there and may be quite contentious. Um, I'll, actually, I'll ask you the question. Okay. You, what, what height do you reckon we rode with in the pair? Oh, gate height. Gate to C. Round number. I, what, would you, what would you expect? What would you expect from a, an elite crew? You know, like you, you obviously set up your athletes to honestly, have something. I have, I have no idea with sweep in a pair. I'd, I can't even, I couldn't even take a stab in the dark. Um, what about, yeah, but sculling's not super different. Sculling, see, you've got 10 mil overlap, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, 14, 16 cm? So historically, we were always rowing sort of 170 to 180 seat, like seat to gate height. Okay. You know, whatever. It's not that high. Like, where's my ruler? Um, you know, it's not that high. It's only about that much. But that gave us, you know, that was just historically what we started to do. And you see some crews, you know, once you're way right up here, you know they're really high. Um, and we t we changed it and we were rowing like Hamish was about 156 and I was like 160 really low really 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 low yeah and to a point where yeah to a point where it was like if anyone had measured our boat up in the boat park they would have been like what the fuck because nobody rose that low um but what we were finding was it was just like the more height we had it was just it felt like it was too hard to lock the oar in and so we were just like well if we kept and, and uh, you know we, we spent a lot of time being very very uncomfortable trying to row at low stuff um, you know, fucking hitting water everywhere. And it was like, is this going to be worth it? But we stuck at it to a point that we were like, you can just put it in and just and just literally press away. And all your weight distributions, like through the core, under your armpits, there's nothing that feels like there's any tension up here at all. Zero, nothing. You know, not even like, oh, I've got to be like, you know, you can feel it up through your triceps and all that sort of shit. It was all here. The whole thing was just this this low hang which created such an amazing ability to, once you can hang off those lats and use those as the hanging force, not any of this muscle group here, massive, you know, such a huge amount of power that we could then try and generate into the boat. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things is people are too high, you know, they're drawing way up here, you know, all this sort of stuff, whereas they don't need to be that high. A lot of that height situation comes from, I don't want to hit water on the way forward. I get it. Like, we, like I'm the same. I fucking hate the balance being off. It's, it was <laughs> terrible. But at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, but you like you got to push through it, and you got to get better at the craft. You've got to, you've really got to try and refine it as much as possible. And the data shows if it's if it's a little bit less here, you know, you're not going to have as much um, uh, shaft in the water. You know, you start losing. You know, if 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 you're out of the, if it's not that far in the water, less every stroke is that not a beneficial thing you know all of these sort of things started to come into the equation and you just start adding them up like your recipe and you're pouring everything into your mixing bowl 
Uh, and the, the less and less mistakes or the less and less like bad things that you're having to put into that bowl, uh, the better it can come out. And that was it. Just starting to learn and understand those sort of things um, was, was, yeah, it was, it was, um, it was, it really did change a lot about what we, what we, what we thought yeah. we knew about rowing, about what we had been taught, um, you know, and, and that was sort of the thing because sometimes we'd sit there going, Fuck, we fucking wasted like, and, and it, I got really angry at a few stages because we just like, we felt like we'd wasted years and years and years of time not having this, you know, just, just a, a common understanding about some of the stuff. But it was just because what we were doing was a program that was was run by a dictator, by a guy who just told you what the fuck to do. We didn't shut, you didn't do anything, but it worked. The results worked very, very well. We won, you know, everybody won. Pretty much anyone that was rowing with Dick won. Yeah. But a lot of that, and but I put that down to majority of that just being survival. And we were just fitter than everybody else. It, it was that simple, you know, like the horrific training shit that we did was just was unbelievable and to a point where sometimes you're just like why am i doing this it's, this is not what i'm here for and that's why you majority of times you know and you know mahi did it because he went back and rode with him you know in the second cycle but the fact was he wasn't training every day in the water because his back was screwed he was spending a lot of time on the bikes as well so he could handle it it was fine <laughs> um but but that's what i mean is you've got to start to understand you know, the way that it's always been done, is there a better way? And we've got so yeah. much data and so much, you know, like Nelson Kellerman's now got force meters, you know, like we've got speed telemetry. You can put it on your phone. You know, you can fucking measure it as you're going along. These iPhones have got force things in them. You know, you can, you can graph shit. It's great. Um, and I think that's what people need to understand is they need to see that feedback, not use it religiously, but at the same time, mm. have a look at it, get a feeling for it, and then move on with it, you know, and try it out, test things, change things. We, we change shit all the time, you know, yeah. to, to a point of just trying to find what's working. And things would work really well at training. But then when we got up to race pace, we were like, nah, it's shit. You know, whereas the other way, we got a little bit slow in training. But then once we started doing pieces, it felt so much smoother and more efficient. And we'd be like, well, do we sacrifice training speed for high end speed or do we need to try and find the middle ground because we don't want to be slow at training. Otherwise we can't keep up with training partners. You know, it's, it all becomes such a big complex um, uh, <laughs> calculation at the end of the day. And you just got to find out what's going to work for you and, yeah. and run with it. I think that's a really, uh, it's a good, really good example of like, just because something's working doesn't mean you can continue to keep experimenting and you shouldn't just be content with what is, working and you always like try and find that that new that new corner that you can improve on and that experimentation without fear of like oh my god what if we change it and everything fall, falls apart realistically if you tweak something mm. you can always go back to it and being scared of making a little change like is good on that point regression. on that point okay one piece of advice that i'll always give to everybody only ever change one variable yeah only yeah. one variable yeah. <laughs> only one the number of times you see people and they'll be like, right, it didn't go very well this weekend. We're going to change the height. Uh, we're going to move the riggers forward and we're going to change the oars. And then it goes bad and you go, well, what was it? Or it goes good. And you go, well, what was it? Was it the oars, the rigger or the, the height? Do you know what I mean? And so so any 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 variation change or anything that you do. Um, and this is the great thing about rowing because it's an experiment and you've got time. Well, time is on your side, Relative, but it's also yeah. your enemy. Yeah. yeah, you can you you got to you got to try something, give it a go for a week or two, and then test it out. You know whether it's some pieces, sub maxes, whatever. Go, oh, well, we tried this and it worked, it didn't work. Uh, back to the drawing board, know where your benchmark was originally. Come back to that, right? We'll change that back, and then and then carry on forward. And it's just trying to find those things all the way through. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Really good, um, good advice for sure. To just yeah never be never be satisfied i guess with with where you are you can always find more that's mm. what that's for me what i love i love about the sport but um sure. look like one thing i would really like like to get in with into with you as well is like actual training and physiology and like i've heard some things that you've been saying and obviously lots of other people in other nations totally agree with but i i would say i would have different opinions on and um goes back to the technical thing as well like ways to skin a cat your eyebrows went up there so um <laughs> I'm um, waiting to hear what yeah, you're going to say. Yeah, yeah, I would like to, I'd really like to, um, but I think that could be a, a whole nother podcast in itself. And I think kind of just what, with what you're saying, there would be a, a good way to like round up and everything. Um, so 
yeah, I guess to to finish, I don't know you you did kind of summarize it quite well there, but if you've got any like finishing um things you'd like to to go on about, um feel free or uh, if you're your co obviously where you could say we're we're competitors, but if you wanted to talk about um like what what you're doing and what you're offering, if anybody listening has swayed more to to your side or vice versa um yeah i don't know if anything you wanted to to cap off with uh yeah no well well yeah we've fuck, we've talked about a lot of stuff um uh-huh. no i i'm just i'm from from my experience i'm just a bigger advocate for um in terms of the rowing stroke um at the end of the day it's got to be a continuous motion um the using your body, your momentum, your inertia, uh, your compression, all of these different bits and pieces help you to become faster. Um, you know, the way that you use your body, uh, the sequencing of your stroke, the sequencing of the firing of the muscle groups, getting them to work together is, is the key in all of it, right? Um, You've got to be able to work the boat. You've got to be able to create the speed. We're, 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 we're both on the same page with that, okay? But I, I, I really honestly believe that there's so much effort needs to be put onto not slowing the boat down. Um, I know we can't be super religious about it because at the end of the day, as you come into the catch and then you take the catch, you know, if you don't create the speed, you're not going to get the runoff on the other side anyway. So it's a double-edged sword, no matter what you, no matter the way that you look at it. Um, but yes, uh, definitely try and understand what you do and how that affects the boat. Okay, um, you know, we all do exercises where you do straight arms and then you know you go uh, straight arms off the front, holding the body forward, and then you swing the body. You know, and a lot of times you're like, actually, this feels really good, and then you add the arms and you don't see a huge amount more speed. So you're like, okay, what does that tell you? Okay, maybe we need to be more efficient with the way that we draw on the body, uh, the way that we take the blade out of the water, using all the little parts to your benefit. Because at the end of the day, we put so much fucking effort into trying to make the boat go fast. And if we don't look at the other side of it, of just riding with the boat speed, the speed that we've already created, we slow it down. Okay, Erg's a fantastic tool to look at that, right? All you got to do is get it up to speed and then tap it along, tap it along, tap along. Now, yes, still using a lot of energy to tap it along. You don't have all the other variables in it, but you don't have to keep working the machine or working the machine. The moment you're working it too hard, you are just using way too much gas and your cup is just emptying out way too fast. Um, And so when you're on the water, just understanding about what you're doing and how you're dictating the blade, it's heavy, right? You've got leverage, let it go in the water feel the water you don't have to hit the front um you want to be caressing you want to be like you want to be able to lever the boat past the blade you know that's one thing that was one of our one of our main focuses lever the boat past the blade it wants to lock in the water if it's not locking in the water check the fucking pitch okay put it in the water and then just lever it past and then once it's running it's all about your rhythm and your flow getting back to the front now if we go right back to the start and the reason this conversation one of our main things Yes, even though we talked about this whole thing coming forward, our call that we used to use all the time was one speed forward. One speed forward. Okay, so the hand speed should move around with patience and then we should just be one speed into the front. Don't think about decelerating. Don't think about coming whatever into the catch. Uh, Just try it. Get a boat up to speed and then just come into the catch and feel how the boat's running underneath you and you just come into the front. And then your natural body compression will stop you. You can't over. You can't crash off the front of the of the rails and fucking carry on forward. It's not going to happen. Your body's going to stop you in, into a position, and you're like, right, I'm here. Hello, I've arrived. And then start doing that more and more often when you're like, oh, hello, I've arrived. And just before you arrive, the blade's just disappearing into the water, you know. And the more that you can try and pick up that speed of the boat and tap it along, think about it. It's you. You create as rowers. You know, we create all of the speed by using the energy to get the boat up to speed. And then we just got to protect the speed. Okay. Protect the speed of the boat should become a very common phrase that you use all the time. If you can protect the speed that you've created, 
okay, you're in a really, really good frame to continue that on for as long as you possibly can. Okay, so protecting that speed of the boat. Um, and I think that's probably the way that I think a lot of people need to look at things because you can you can use a lot of legs off the front. You can be stiff and upright. Like so many, like you, if you put if you put every rower up on the board and on a picture and, and showed all of their strokes, everybody's completely different because we've got lever difference, height difference, weight different, flexibility differences, fucking everything else. Um, but I definitely think that once you start getting that understanding of the smoothness and not missing the front and getting speed and picking up the speed, feeling it in your feet. Learn how to row a single, okay? Learn how to fucking row a single. If you can't row one, get in one. Try and get one. Say to your coach, I want to spend a month in the single because that really does teach you about um, what makes the bike go fast. And use those as, as a from a coaching point of view. Any coaches out there, start like asking your athletes to think about how they're creating the speed and then how they're protecting the speed. You know, what are they trying to do to maintain the pace? You know, like, how do they feel like the boat's going? Can they hear the boat? Um, can they see what effect they have on the boat? Because all of these things come into the equation when you're trying to, to ultimately be a faster crew than anybody else. Because most of the time it comes down to the fact you don't have to be the biggest and strongest. You've just got to make the least negative force on the boat. That's rowing. Rowing shouldn't be called rowing. It should be zipping up and down in a boat, making the least amount of force possible. You know, and the moment you start understanding that and getting that as an idea into your head, the, the better chance you've got at trying to find improvement, okay? Um, and, that's, and that's as simple as it goes because we spent years and years and years of our life trying to work hard, okay? We all work hard. Like nobody, a coach is never going to have to tell you, push harder, push harder, push harder because they know you're pushing hard. Everybody knows you're working hard. Everybody knows that. Um, but a lot of time it's like you're pushing hard, but you're not doing it in the right fashion. Okay. And that's why things can be pretty slow. And so it's just learning, understanding, um, mix it up, uh, try it on the row machine, listen to it, listen to the whirl of the machine, and then just pick it up, hang off it, use all these little muscle groups that can make so much speed for you that you just didn't realize. Um, it's not just all about being big and strong. It's about efficiency. And that's the key. Awesome yeah awesome yeah yeah i um yeah uh, yeah thanks for thanks for the the all the information value you're providing eric and uh yeah it's been really really good to to listen to all these things and i do i do like to say i have an open mind so there's certainly things that i mm. i think that's good coaching is having an open mind to things and never never know it like always knowing that there's never going to be one right way to do it and always trying to use pull from different um, techniques and fit like philosophies and fit like training methods and get the best results for athletes but um yeah i would oh, like look yeah. if you if you'd be keen for it i'd love to like have a, a, another one at some point down the line um when you're not crazy busy and stuff and like, chat about other things if you'd like um we'll do yeah. an, we can do an indoor rowing one pal i'll tell you an indoor rowing one the indoor oh. rowing one will be good i yeah because okay. I, yeah. I think there's yeah there's there's a lot of space um you know, I've I've had a few specific programs for people and I'd love to do a little bit more and I'd probably try either tied in with a sensei or whatever. Um, but when you get very uh, physiologically specific, probably the terminology to use, um, you can start to find speed on the rowing machine and you can start to adapt your physiology. Because the only way to get better at 2K is to adapt your physiology. Um, that's as simple as it goes, right? It's, it's not, it's not, a lot of times it's not getting fitter. It's not getting stronger. It's actually adapting your physiology. And so it's workouts where they're not just 500s on repeat or they're not this, you know, it could be, and they're all very specifically targeted. And, and like I've worked with, you know, our physiologist who, you know, he's a doctor in physiology, he's fucking trained and he trains Ironman and all this sort of stuff. I sat down with him and, and we used to discuss it all the time and we've done programs, um, you know, and it's, it's like doing, you know, you set yourself a target and there's a split, there's a watts, there's a net, there's amount of power that you have to be able to sustain for that period of time. So in training, it's like, well, okay, let's do some 40 second pieces at 105% on repeat, 10 of them, you know, things like that, things like that, that people don't think about where they're like, Oh, we're going to do some one minute pieces today. And so everyone just goes fucking balls to the wall. Whereas actually, if you were doing them at say 104, 103, 102, 101, and then back up or something like that, your body starts to adapt. And so it becomes 
easily, it becomes easier to manage the stress that is put on you by yourself, obviously, physically, but you start to get better at understanding that stress, which is obviously your adaption and physiology. So then when it comes time to hit 100% for four minutes, you're like, fuck, that was pretty easy because you've adapted that physiology all the way through. And so then you get to a point where you're like, all you have to do is just do that split for six minutes, 10, or whatever your target's been, mm -hmm. and you're going to do it. And every single time that I've had people do that, they've pushed five or six seconds, and these are top-level athletes, they've pushed five or six seconds to get national trials or to get themselves into teams, uh, all because they just didn't understand or they didn't have it. You know, there's a lot of people out there that are just working off time and distance. They're not actually working off physiological splits off you, off what you're capable of doing. And at the end of the day, most people go into 2K stuff blind, blind as shit. They're like, I don't know what I'm going to hit today. Yeah. I'd like to break I'd like to break six minutes. And you're like, well, what's your personal best? And I'll be like, 684. Okay, so how's the training been going? I don't know. Did some 500s yeah. the other day, 128. I'm big on okay, pace yeah, how guidance much? for sure. Uh, yeah. yeah. I do, and, and I do so all of the, the like, more... whole high intensity for me is like, pace pace recommendations generally with it with some scope of course but yeah certainly yeah and need that. oh mate but you've but got yeah. to go you've got to you've got to have a whole lot of different you've got to have long bo2 short bo2 anaerobic yeah. threshold you've got to you've got to mix it all amongst it and some of it is For horrific sure. like there, there's a few and like we you know we do the reason i could get down to uh, you know 541 542s were my times um but we were doing those in in february you know like I, we'd, we'd have a month off in, in August, September, and then we'd sort of train October, November, December, January, boom, and I'm doing a 542. Never did one later season. If I'd done one later season, 100% yeah, I'm breaking you saying in your book, 540. 100% yeah. I'm breaking 540. Never, ever had the opportunity. Did did some pieces that were like quite close. And one time, fuck, I was on fire doing some pieces, and I was like, man, I'd love to do a 2K now. I reckon I could rip it to pieces. Mm. But we're just like, we're three weeks out from World Champs. Ain't no way you're doing a 2K yeah, three no. weeks out from World Champs. Yeah. But I, I definitely think for both sides, for people that are loving indoor um, and people like athletes wanting to get faster on 2K, I, 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 could, I could get people faster, no, no sweat. And it's just having, like, you just got to have faith in knowing what's working, you know, and for you, you know, you know what works and you, you use that and you adapt it and you, and you, uh -huh. you just got to get the belief and you got to get the sign on from the athletes and you just be like, trust me, look, and, and the one thing is I trusted our physiologist the whole time when he's setting me stuff. And I'm like, you really want me to do that? And he'd be like, yep, yeah, you're not going to finish it. And I'm like, damn right, I'm not going to finish it, but I'm fucking going to try. Oh, and, yeah. he, and, then he'd, and then afterwards, when you're a pile of mess on the floor, he'll be like, if I got you to do that again in two weeks, you'll, you'll be able to do it because now your body knows what it's in, in store for. So it's just stuff like that where we, we're a little bit afraid to push out, but we've got to push out in the right way. It's not just max mm -hmm. straight off the bat. You've got to build, you've got to do this, and yeah. it just changes. Um, and a lot of that, we can tie that right back into the stuff that you do on water as well. At the end of the day, if you don't have like the, a good enough program, if you're just sitting there rowing at 20 all day or whatever you're doing, you've got to be able to get that mix of intervals and tempo and and U1 and UT2 and, and put it all in there and, and, you know, max pressure and all this sort of stuff because that's what makes you better. But it's doing that better under pressure while you're under, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And that's really the key is trying to make that happen because I've seen so many people that can row very, very well at low rates and For training sure. can be demons. And then when they hit high speed, you're like, oh, why are they at the back door? Uh -huh. You know, that, that's, that, that happens with some really, really good people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So much, so much good stuff to talk about, and definitely, yeah, uh, we'd love, lo we'd love to get um, do this again at some point. Talk all sorts of training stuff, but yeah, yeah. I think good, good point to round. I don't want to like try, maybe try and keep it towards one subject as well, but yeah, uh, but yeah, good round up there. Thank you again, Eric, for for no worries. Um, I, yeah, I guess um, for coming. I guess it could, it's not a podcast or anything, but yeah, it's been really enjoyable. Just a chat. It's a yeah, chat. Yeah. Yeah, chat, and uh, I'm sure people will get plenty of take homes from this. But yeah, um, yeah, have yeah, good night. I guess I don't know if you're you're off to bed or whatever, but um, yeah, um, be yeah, in touch, only, Eric, and I'll, I'll look. I'll, at night. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll, I'll be I'll, obviously I've recorded this, so I'll just upload it to YouTube. I can send it over to you as well if you if you'd like. And um, yeah, no, nah, cool. you're right, pal. Send it away. Okay, help cause... help people out. We're helping here. We're helping sure. everybody. Spread the wealth. Saving the world. <laughs> okay, cheers, Eric. 
All right. Thanks, pal. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.